Well, okay. Well, um, good morning. Uh, welcome to our talk, uh, Breaking and Entering Hacking Consumer Security Systems. Um, it's tough being the first talk of the day, uh, so thanks to everyone for uh, making the effort to show up. It's uh, good to see uh, a full house. Um, so, who are we? Well, uh, I'm Dominic, this is Matthew. Uh, we work in the Pentest team at NDSEC. Uh, we've both been involved in the UK InfoSec uh, scene for quite some time. Uh, this is the second time I've spoken at B-Sides, uh, or Manchester B-Sides. Um, one thing I'd like to kind of uh, stress about this uh, presentation is um, it's not just the work that me and Matthew have done, um, it's actually a kind of collaborative effort from some of the other guys in our team. Um, it's really the output of um, kind of several research nights that we've done. Um, unfortunately, the other guys who were involved, uh, particularly uh, Razvan and Alex, are uh, both on holiday today, so we couldn't get them down here. But um, it's not just the work of myself and Matthew, it's pretty much everyone, well, a couple of the other guys at NDSEC. Um, so, what is our talk about? Well, um, essentially, um, I'm not going to lie to you, it's pretty much a uh, junk hacking talk. Um, <laughs> Effectively, we're going to be talking about um, what we call consumer security systems, but these are things like um, effectively that you can buy off the shelf. Um, so you might see them in small to medium sized businesses. Uh, you might even have some of them at home. Um, some of the devices we're talking about, I've got installed at my house. If you actually want to break into my house, listen to this talk. Um, effectively, it's things like uh, IP cameras, uh, digital video recorders, um, intruder alarms, uh, CCTV systems. Um, the kind of stuff that you use to kind of uh, monitor or protect your um, premises. Um, so I first started looking at these devices uh, roughly about two years ago, uh, which was when I got the um, system installed at my house. And I'm not gonna lie to you, it was quite an expensive system. I got a professional installer to come and set it all up for me. Um, at the time, uh, the guy who was installing it basically said to me, oh, you, know, you need to give this an IP address and uh, give me access to your router and I'll uh, port forward stuff so you can get to it from your mobile. And I was like, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have a little bit of a look at this before I uh, you know, put it on my home line and uh, connect it up to the internet. Um, and unsurprisingly, this thing was uh, pretty incredibly insecure. And I'll talk about some of the issues that we found in it later on. Um, However, these devices are generally quite interesting, um, mainly because uh, they're used as a physical security control or deterrent. So if you're actually able to compromise one of these devices, uh, it might assist you in um, gaining physical access to um, an environment. Also, what you'll find is um, some of these devices are actually internet connected, uh, which might means you might actually uh, be able to get a remote uh, kind of uh, access into you know, an organization. Um, and finally, what, you're, what you'll hopefully see from the output of this talk is um, these kind of devices are a much softer target. Um, and, I'm not, and I don't just specifically mean these devices, I mean actually IoT in gen general. IoT security is actually uh, light years behind um, the security of desktop environments, um, which is why they've become more of a target for um, cyber criminals. So in the kind of run-up to this talk, um, I started to have a look at... Uh, some of the press that was kind of out there for um, these sorts of devices. And um, some of the stuff I started to see was um, things like uh, Lizard Squad uh, creating an IoT botnet, um, several hacker groups uh, creating uh, webcam malware, IoT devices being used in uh, DDoS nets, and then more recently, uh, how a vulnerability in um, some D-Link IP cameras uh, affected over um, 400,000 devices uh, and they, these could be trivially compromised. So this hopefully uh, reinforces why um, IoT security is a bit of a problem. So, the first device we looked at um, is this uh, Hick Vision uh, DVR. Um, so this was one of the devices that I got installed at my house. Um, and as I say, this, this was something that I started looking at around about two years ago. This is what the DVR system looks like. Uh, if you're passing as you leave the room, you can have a look at it here. This is the DVR down here. 
we've taken it to pieces. We've got um, a UART console connected to it, so you can have a look at the internals of the board. Um, the HIC Vision DVR basically provides all the um, recording and management functionality for the CCTV cameras. We, as I say, we first started looking at this about two years ago. Um, so some of the bugs have actually been fixed. Um, and the first, the version that I was given when they installed it at my house was uh, a version 3.01 of the firmware, which is where most of our bugs have been sort of uh, researched. Um, but it's worth noting that um, actually the firmware upgrade process is, is a manual thing. Um, so you've actually got to go to Hikvision's um, website. You've got to find the right version of the firmware based on the model of the device that you've got. Um, so what I actually think in reality is a lot of these devices that are out there are, are kind of set and forget. They're probably just still sitting there on the internet with the um, whatever version it w of the firmware it was shipped with. Um, and I can tell you actually, um, so on the next slide you'll see some the amount of devices that are out there. I've just casually browsed to a couple of them. Um, obviously not touch them because, uh, you know, I'm a professional. And um, But they are like you're running like ancient versions of the firmware. Uh, under the hood, this device is um, pretty much just embedded Linux um, with BusyBox on top. So, um, how many of these devices are actually out there? Well, as you can see, they're actually pretty prevalent. Um, I had a look on Shodan, and it reckoned there was at least 116,000 in the US alone. So if you are interested in making an IoT botnet, this device is probably a good starting point. Um, so the way the device works is um, essentially it's managed via either a mobile application or your web browser. Just browse to the, um, you know, the default landing page of the device. Authentication um, for the device is, um, you know, as you would expect, basic username and password. The default credentials for the device are admin and 12345. And once you're into the web application, um, it's then possible to enable uh, the telnet service and you can log into the device as root and the password is whatever you've set it to on the web interface. So far, so good. Um, one of the kind of uh, most obvious trivialish, trivial issues that we noticed when we were looking at this device was there was no kind of account lockout on the uh, web interface, which meant you could trivially brute force the authentication. Maybe that's not a problem in itself because um, when you configure the device, you set it up, um, you are actually forced to uh, reset the password. However, unfortunately, it actually only allows you to reset it to another numeric value, um, which, as you can guess, is trivially brute forceable. So um, I will uh, just quickly show a demo of this. Hopefully, if everything goes to plan. Awesome. So how's that? Uh, okay, okay, cool. So, um, it'd be good if I could just pin this so I could use both hands. But, uh, just bear with me two seconds. Okay. Cool. So the device is up, which is a good good starting point. Um, so this is the device down here. It's, it's powered on. I'm going to try and do this as a live demo. So uh, pray to the demo gods. Um, So I've got a little uh, Python script which uh, should, fingers crossed, uh, just uh, brute force the uh, password for the device. And I've not modded the password, it's actually just set to the default at the moment. But if the password have set something else, it should hopefully find it. And you can see it's uh, running through the brute force now. And my little Python script should, you know, it's identified the password. It will connect to the web service, enable Telnet D, and then it will uh, kick off a Telnet session and show you a remote root shell. This is where you applaud. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that's the uh, the first first root shell of the day. There are more to come. Um, so yeah, this was the first uh, first device we looked at. This is 
is where you're relying on PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. Awesome. Cool. So, um, so this was something that I spotted uh, roughly uh, two years ago and didn't really think it was much of a big deal, to be honest. I didn't actually, at the time, know how many devices were, of these were sitting on the internet. But um, So um, we started to kind of uh, put together some uh, data and you know slides for this talk, and then I remembered, oh yeah, I've got this Hick Vision device that's massively vulnerable. Um, but I couldn't actually remember what the, um, the I'd set the credentials for uh, when we came to look at it. Um, so, um, and yeah, I, I just couldn't find the brute force script anywhere that I'd written when the guy was installing it. This, 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 the script that I've just run now, literally I had the guy at my house and he was like, oh yeah, okay, can I plug this into your LAN? And I was like, okay, I'm going to look at it. And while he was setting it up, I wrote this like little Python script which brute forced it. I was like, you're not plugging this thing into my network. Um, so, um, yeah, effectively, uh, basically when we came to do this research, I didn't have any of the data because it was kind of like two years ago. Um, so I thought, all right, okay, maybe I just left the password as the uh, default password. I thought I'll just do a quick Google, find out what the default creds are, and I'll log onto the device. So I looked around and um, stumbled on the, uh, the Hick Vision manual uh, for this device. Um, and what I found was there was actually a supported way to reset the password, and which kind of caught my attention. I was like, what does it mean, a supported way to reset the password? So I started looking into it. Uh, and effectively, um, the way the kind of password re uh, reset process works is there's a tool that you can just download from Hick Vision's website. Um, and it's called the Hick Vision Support Tool. Uh, and effectively, uh, if you're on the same line as the device, it will um, give you the serial number and the start time of the device. Um, and then what you need to do, you take the start time and you take the serial number, you call up Hick Vision and you say, okay, I want to reset my password. And they give you a code which allows you to change the password on the device. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a problem because uh, if Hick Vision can reset the password on your device, then anybody who's actually able to reverse the algorithm can also reset the password. Um, so um, it turns out actually somebody who has reversed the algorithm and I didn't actually need to do any research on this, I just needed to uh, go to IP Cam Talk. Um, so effectively these guys had um, pretty much reversed the process, they found out that uh, effectively it was a very simple uh, bit shifting algorithm, you just fed in the um, serial number, the uh, date the device booted uh, and it did a little bit of bit shifting and um, will give you a reset code that you could put into the device and you could reset the password. Uh, and they've provided a little, uh, basically they've re-implemented this in JavaScript, so you can browse to their website and um, any of these devices that are online, you can effectively reset the password on them, which you know, obviously totally undermines the uh, need for authentication. Um, the other thing that um, kind of I raised an eyebrow about while I was reviewing the uh, manual for this device was, Actually, there's also a, a supported way to um, remotely install some new firmware. So um, essentially, when the device boots, um, when, when you turn it on, it um, connects to this magic IP address, which is uh, 192.0.0.128. Um, and it will try and connect to this IP address, and it will try and download a new firmware image via TFTP. Um, so, um, and the firmware image it downloads is completely unsigned. Um, it basically just it just checks the checksum within the firmware image. Um, so, obviously, if you're on the same LAN as this device um, and you can cause a denial of service condition in the device, it's got a software watchdog on it. If you can trigger the software watchdog, the device will reboot. And when if you're on the same LAN as it, you just set your IP to 192.0.0.128 and it will download a firmware image from you which gives you a nice little way to uh, install a kind of a persistent backdoor on the device. If you are interested in doing um, assessments of these devices, uh, it is pretty useful to have a command shell. So um, you can do this quite easily because the device is shipped with a uh, UART port enabled. All you need to do to get a UART command shell is um, basically just have a small female uh, Molex connector um, or you can solder directly to the pins, uh, which is what we ended up doing. Um, and when the device boots up, you'll get a command shell. Uh, on the UART console, what you'll find is the device actually gives you access as a guest user. Um, 
But as I've already mentioned, uh, we know that the root password is the same as whatever the admin pin is set to, and the default is one, two, three, four, five. So this is what um, effectively how we got the UART shell. Um, basically, um, what you can probably see is we well we use the JTAGulator um, in pass th in uh, UART pass mode, um, and the pin configuration was. Um, Red is ground, um, orange is transmit, and yellow is receive. And if you connect the um, connect the device with this configuration, you should get a command shell. So um, Matt will uh, just give you a quick run through of the next device that we looked at. So uh, so Dominic installed an alarm system to stop people like me breaking into his house. So uh, we decided we'd take a look at it, which was uh, essentially it's a, a wireless alarm system manufactured by a company called uh, Risco Agility. Uh, it's basically a general purpose computer that has a number of sensors installed around his home for motion and shock detection. Um, it's quite typical of what you see in a consumer, um, a consumer home alarm system or small business premises system. Um, it's not really the type of thing you see in a, a banking branch or anything like that, but uh, certainly for the, uh, the home environment. Um, this, uh, this device has a, a number of fobs, which uh, essentially is a, a wireless key fob, uh, a proximity fob that's used for disabling the alarm, turning the alarm off, and then also you have uh, a keypad uh, system for inputting a, a pin code for, turn, for turning the alarm on and off again. Um, and what we're seeing is that a lot of wireless connectivity is increasingly being targeted these days due to the cheap and readily available access of general purpose radios or software-defined radio platforms. So um, this is effectively the alarm system that he installed. Um, you can see here the, the main panel is uh, effectively where the uh, microprocessor is. Um, the various sensors uh, on the left here, you've got a shock sensor and a motion sensor uh, that are wirelessly sending a signal. If they're breached, then they change the signal. and It sends, it sends the uh, alarm has been tripped. Um, and you also have the keypad there. Um, from a physical point of view, if you're using uh, a UV light and some fingerprint powder, um, you could kind of target the keypad, but we wanted to look at the, um, uh, the wireless connectivity. In particular, we wanted to look at uh, Dominic's wireless fob. So uh, we took apart the, um, the user documentation, and actually there wasn't any FCC ID, which is normally where we'd start for this. Instead, when we opened up the, uh, the PDFs and manuals, we found that uh, it actually listed uh, the frequency that it was in use on, which is part of the ISM band here in the UK, um, which was 868 megahertz. And it even mentioned that it was using a rolling code. So we kind of already had an idea of whereabouts in the radio spectrum um, this particular transmitter would be. Um, but we uh, opened it up anyway. Um, and this is the uh, inside of uh, the wireless fob. Um, you effectively have uh, a very few uh, components. There's a crystal uh, oscillator and then this uh, TH72032 uh, transmitter, transceiver, uh, which is basically in the data sheet tells us what the modulation was, which was amplitude shift keying, um, and it could modulate data up to 40 uh, kilobits a second. Um, and uh, essentially, when we reviewed through that data sheet, we determined that there was no other modulation supported by this chipset. So we knew vaguely whereabouts it was in the radio spectrum, um, and we also know uh, the modulation uh, type that was in use. So uh, we took a, a hack RF. Um, or you could use another SDR, and we basically uh, did an FFT plot, pressed the uh, button to try and determine the frequency, and then once we knew that, we basically knocked together this uh, little new radio flow graph. Um, essentially, all this is doing is uh, it takes the, uh, the input source for the radio spectrum, um, and it's uh, just slightly off from where the transmitter is. Um, it, it does some math to move the signal to the center point of the flow graph, um, we then feed that through a bandpass filter so that we remove the unwanted part of the radio spectrum. And then we take the complex signal and convert it to um, a magnitude so we get the actual amplitude of the, uh, the waveform. Uh, we resample that down to something that we could then hear. Um, and then we also uh, we added a, a multiplied value to it so that we could get a, an increased uh, visual of what the waveform actually looked like. So um, using that, we could effectively capture a, a, a signal from the, uh, from the wireless press. Um, and this is basically what you saw. When, when you press a button, um, you would see these bursts of data, um, which basically there was eight bursts per button press, which is just basically the ones and zeros of the rolling code uh, being transmitted. And because we'd increased the magnitude, we could actually have a look at the, uh, the modulation scheme. 
Um, so the fact that it's amplitude shift keying, what that means is that the, uh, the amplitude of the waveform is increased depending um, or decreased depending on whether it's a zero or a one. So you have here this um, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. So effectively using that flow graph, a tool like Boardline, um, and knowing the timing, we could actually uh, capture back that signal and have a look at the code that was being transmitted to his alarm. Um, equally, because we knew it was a rolling code, it actually turned out to be quite a trivial thing um, to sort of jam and replay. This is a known attack against rolling codes in that if you capture a rolling code offline or you jam someone's transmission and capture their code and then replay it back to the device, um, you essentially can, uh, can uh, replay that signal back and then cause the alarm uh, or, the, or the system that's expecting it to, 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 to act. Um, this is a, a new radio flow graph that just takes the baseband sample um, and replays it. It's really not much more complicated than that. So uh, we've got a little demo um, where we just basically uh, captured a signal. We'd already previously had the signal um, swiped from, the, uh, from Dominic's desk. And uh, then I went and broke into his house. Obviously, uh, I'd love to have you all around my house, but uh, it's not big enough, so we've uh, kind of videoed this one. Yep. Um, so. Lovely kitchen. Do you want to replay that? Whoa. So yeah, we captured the code and went around to Dom's house. Set the alarm off. And then I went in the kitchen and made myself a cup of tea and you can actually hear the alarm to, and, and, uh, to tell us that it had disabled itself. So, um, yeah, and then uh, you're on the next slide now. So I'll pass you back to Dominic. Cheers, Matt. Um, it's great that you've just told everybody how to break into my house as well. That's okay, they can download the sample. <laughs> Uh, come on, Mark, your OSIN is uh, surely good enough to find out. Um, so, uh, actually, I'll see if I can just uh, pin this to me. <laughs> this was a bad idea. I'll just hold it. Okay, so um, the next device that we looked at was... Um, a uh, Motorola Scout uh, 85 Connect. Um, so this device is um, essentially uh, rebranded for a number of different purposes. Um, the device that we got um, was the RSPCA approved uh, pet monitor, but it's also exactly the same device for um, things like security cameras, uh, webcams, baby monitors, all effectively does the same thing. Um, the way the device works is um, it basically provides you um, with remote access via um, the cloud. Um, so you can uh, install an app on your phone and you can view what's going on uh, via your mobile phone. Under the hood, the device is um, essentially built just using embedded Linux and BusyBox uh, on an ARM v5 chip. So uh, we focused mainly on uh, version 17 of the firmware because this was the device that it was installed. This was the version that was it was installed with. Um, however, the majority of the bugs that we found in it are still uh, present in the latest version of the firmware, and we have reported some of these to uh, Motorola. So, um, how kind of prevalent are these devices? Well, um, according to Shodan, they're a lot less prevalent than the uh, the other the Hick Vision device. But I guess if you're uh, building an IoT botnet, every device probably counts. So um, you can probably go and own some of these on the internet. Um, so our approach to uh, looking at this device was uh, effectively, uh, we initially grabbed the mobile app, uh, we decompiled the uh, Android app, uh, and it revealed a couple of uh, kind of interesting URLs. Um, effectively, these were links to the firmware. 
Um, so we downloaded the firmware, unpacked it, and started looking for bugs. Um, there were a number of kind of interesting things that we first found when we unpacked the firmware. Uh, there were a few files that look pretty interesting sitting in the web route. Um, there was one kind of master binary process uh, which seemed to launch all the services on the device uh, via shared libraries, and that was something that we looked at. Um, our next kind of step was to see what was the um, kind of footprint on the, of the device on the network. So uh, we ran um, a little port scan on the device um, to have a look what was going on. As you can see, there's a couple of uh, web servers, there's uh, a streaming server, uh, and also a couple of uh, random unknown services. When we were port scanning the device, what we noticed was um, it kept generating some white noise when we were, um, and I mean literally through the speaker, it was generating white noise. And we we're like, okay, what, what the hell is going on here? Um, so we eventually narrowed it down to um, the service on uh, port 51108 was um, pretty much connected to the audio in on, of the device. So we're like, okay, well, if this is connected to the audio in, um, what can we do with it? Um, so we started just sending like music files to it, just trying to see what was going on. Uh, and eventually we figured out if you send the right file type to it, which turned out to be some 16-bit uh, mono encoded WAV file, um, the device would just literally play it like, un unauthenticated on the on the kind of network, which you know is is kind of uh, interesting. Um, but you know it's not a root shell. So um, the next thing we kind of spotted was. Um, the web service on the device, so if you go to the landing page, the IP of the device, um, there's no kind of web app there or anything like that. It's all supposed to be kind of managed through the uh, the mobile app. Um, however, all the web services were completely unauthenticated. Um, so uh, not only that, there was no kind of like CSRF protection. So if you are on the internet and um, you are able to kind of figure out the IP of one of these devices, you might be able to trigger some of these bugs. Um, there were kind of um, several interesting files sitting in the web route, and I don't think these were supposed to be there. Um, I think they were probably there because the device has been uh, repurposed. I randomly browsed to some of them, and they were kind of describing it as a baby monitor, even though it was supposed to be a pet monitor from RSPCA. Um, but basically, these things allowed you to do stuff like move the device, uh, reconfigure the wireless, uh, or upgrade the firmware which is obviously a little bit more serious because you could potentially use CSRF to uh, install your own arbitrary firmware on the device. So let's have a little uh, look at a demo of uh, some of the stuff in this device. Okay. So um, this is the device here, and um, I know obviously people at the back probably can't quite see it as well, but um, the guys on the front have got the best view. So um, as I said, you've got this random TCP port, <laughs> which you can uh, get to play music. If, um, if you are a bit of a uh, Rick Astley fan, then uh, like this device is, you can also uh, get the thing to dance. So, um, guys at the back probably can't see, but they, uh, the device is actually starting to uh, move around. Uh, and there is no way to stop this, by the way. I have to actually literally, uh, I have to actually unplug the thing to, to get it to stop kind of playing music. <laughs> I've had enough of that, so I'll just uh, just unplug it. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> so I mean that in itself is um, not a massive issue, but it, it's, you could probably really annoy somebody if you're on the same <laughs> network because there's one of these things. Um, um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, but you know, we wanted some some more interesting bugs. Um, effectively, we wanted something that we could compromise the device with. Um, so, because we got the firmware, we started to kind of audit some of the um, the CGI scripts that were exposed under the web route. 
Um, there was one CGI script that looked uh, particularly interesting, which was this uh, has ERL upgrade CGI. Uh, effectively, this is a CGI script that was invoked um, during the, um, the firmware upgrade process. Um, and what we, uh, what we found in this um, CGI script was um, there was a very, very absolutely you know, trivial uh, to exploit command injection bug. Um, so this was the, uh, the CGI script. And in um, the bit that I've kind of highlighted in red uh, is effectively um, a, a variable that is passed from, from the user. Um, and as you can probably see, it's ended up uh, getting uh, concatenated into a, um, an operating system command. So as you can guess, absolutely trivial uh, command injection. Um, so I can hopefully demo, well, I can demo this. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the bad news is um, we did plan to demo this live. Uh, and I've got the device here. Uh, and we had a, we've got the JTAGulator set up uh, with what was a UART connection. Unfortunately, um, on the train, um, it must have like the well the solders come off and it's disconnected. So, um, but fortunately, I videoed it yesterday because I was worried something like this was going to happen. So, um, we have got a demo here. Uh, I'll just play this one. Oh no, that's the wrong one. That's the one we've already played. There we go. This one. This is the one. So. So we're just using uh, the suite here to, uh, and you can see I've highlighted the command that we're sending. Effectively, it is just um, a pipe to uh, inject a new command uh, into the, uh, the name of the, uh, the firmware image that we're uploading. Um, and I'm just, well, the only data that I'm sending is foo. And uh, we send this to um, the device. This is the UART console. So we, th at the time, I had a JTAGulator connected. Uh, ran this command, and you can see uh, actually the uh, device echoes the output of the command it's doing, which is kind of useful if you're trying to kind of RE one of these things. Uh, and it should, because the device had got netcat on it as well, which was awesome, uh, it should actually just kick back a um, command shell. So this is a netcat listen that we had, and it should kick back a reverse shell. So you can see we've now got uh, root access to the device. And you can actually, uh, from the PS output, you can see the uh, the command that was run, which was, again, pretty useful because we'd now rooted the thing. Yeah, please, if that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> it would have been better if it was live, but. Um, so I'm just going to pass you back over to Matthew. Uh, so we had a team of hackers and one device, and then uh, we left them all fuzzing away. And unfortunately, when you leave a team of hackers alone with one device and one way of getting root, um, they tend to break things. So they, uh, they, they broke the device um, in a way that we could no longer get it to boot. So um, a lot of the fuzzing stuff that we were doing um, basically broke it, and we couldn't turn this thing on anymore. Um, so to continue fixing it, um, we needed to fix it. So there was a lot of tears shed. We had a lot of pizza. Um, and there was a very sad pony in the office um, trying to fix this device. So actually, we improved it, I think. Um, this is what it looked like uh, when we started with the device, before we started fix it, before we fixing it. Um, and it had a lovely, kind of nice, uh, you know, home interior sort of IKEA look about it. Um, this is how it ended up. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically sprawled out into several pieces with uh, wires dragged out everywhere on it. And we, uh, we, we you know, cut our fingers and thumbs a few times. Um, so we, uh, what we discovered when we, we ripped this thing apart was that it actually had uh, a couple of different microcontrollers in it. It had one for controlling the motors, um, and it also had uh, a system on chip uh, for controlling and, and running the OS. Um, the system on chip was uh, manufactured by Nuvaton, um, and it was actually an ARM uh, 9 core. Um, which basically uh, ran all of the uh, Linux type OS. Um, and one of the things that we found, we actually dug out a data sheet uh, from a, a development trial board which had this, uh, this sock on it. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's essentially there. And then if you, if you see this little picture here, we can see that there's all these uh, TP labeled points or test points on the PCB. Um, and we actually found that uh, TP4 and 5 uh, were quite important. 
Um, the reason they were quite important was, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the, the data sheet for the, uh, the arm sock. But in the top right corner, um, we actually found that the two pins there were labeled as TX and RX with a U in front of it. Um, and we figured that that was probably most likely a UART of some form. Um, so we used a multimeter to basically do a continuity check from these two pins to all the different test points on the board um, to locate that TP4 and TP5 were actually breakouts for these two pins um, on, the, uh, on the sock itself. So when we soldered onto that, we actually uh, found that we could get another root shell, which was uh, pretty useful. Um, so we had this broken device, we got a root shell on there again, um, and we, uh, we did a little hacking and, and, and fixed up some of the results of the fuzzing. And uh, we were able to, uh, to restore it back to a state whereby we could uh, now uh, continue our research efforts. So I'll hand you back to Dom. Um, so at this point, we'd uh, pretty much got a nice kind of uh, interactive command shell on the device. And we decided, oh, you know, let's try and find some more bugs. So um, one of the kind of interesting things about the device was um, the attack surface was pretty much confined to just the one binary. Uh, and this was um, a binary called MS Loader. And um, basically the way it worked was uh, when the device booted, MS Loader process kicked in. Uh, and it had um, a bunch of shared libraries for all the different kind of services, effectively plugins. So it had plugins for um, the audio service, UPnP, the web server, this kind of stuff. They were all loaded from shared libraries. Um, one of the things uh, we were kind of interested in straight away was um, you know, what kind of protections are in place on, the, on this binary and its um, shared libraries. Um, and effectively, there were very little. So there was no kind of... Um, position independent executable, there were no stack canaries, anything like that, which is kind of good because uh, we wanted to try and exploit some of these bugs that we're, I'm going to talk about now. Um, so we started to uh, RE the uh, MS loader binary. Um, effectively, because I'm a little bit lazy, I started looking for some kind of easy wins. Um, and there were kind of lots of potential issues there. Um, First thing I thought was, well, we, you know, we found one um, command injection in the CGI script. There's probably more command injections in the device. Let's look for some more command injections. So um, I started looking at um, uh, for cross-references to system. There were uh, 88 cross-references to system, which means it's executing a lot of commands on the device. Um, and one of the one that looked the most promising was uh, this setup Wi-Fi uh, command injection. So um, now this was interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, effectively, it was a bit of a buy one, get one free on the bug front because um, we looked at it in IDA and uh, we saw something like this. Um, so the first kind of red arrow is uh, you can see it's uh, taking some um, user-controlled input uh, and it's using sprintf to uh, basically append it to uh, a command which ends up getting run in, in by a system. Uh, which, you know, kind of interesting. We got we found another command injection bug. But, you know, sprint F is not great. Uh, and it's it's uh, concatenating something to a variable that's sitting on the stack. So I thought, okay, well, we've exploited one command injection bug. Let's have a look what the uh, if there's any opportunity to exploit the uh, stack overflow here. So um, if you have a look at the, um, the prolog for the uh, function, uh, you can see what it's actually doing is it's setting up a stack frame of uh, hex 84 bytes. Um, so I thought, okay, well, what happens if I try and send it a massive, you know, request here? What's going on? So I figured out the bit of the um, the web service which was um, accepting this um, variable, and I thought, and I'll just send it a load of uh, a load of A's, a load of Y's, whatever, and see what happens. Um, so the bit I've highlighted in uh, red is kind of important because uh, it shows the length of the uh, string that you're sending, and this has to exist. So if you were fuzzing this, you might not see it because it would just uh, reject anything where if the length field doesn't match. The, uh, the bit in green is the length of actually the SSID that you send it. Uh, and the yellow is um, what I ended up finding out was uh, the value of what the PC register got overwritten as. So uh, I ended up sending the device a request like this, and I watched what happened on the UART console, and it just died to death. The device uh, basically uh, detected a crash, 
software watchdog kicked in, the thing rebooted. So it's like awesome, okay, found a uh, stack overflow. Um, how do we go about exploiting this? Well, um, there were uh, a few kind of constraints. Um, so a couple of things I noticed were uh, both the heap and the stack on the device were completely executable, which was awesome because uh, it meant I could just ex put my shellcode on the stack and execute it. Um, something that was uh, semi-annoying for making this uh, super reliable was um, that ASLR was enabled on the device uh, and it was set to conservative mode. Um, what that means is uh, effectively the base address is um, very poorly randomized. Um, and what we found was actually you can just brute force the base address of the device. Um, so if you want to exploit one of these things, you can have a, a pretty reliable exploit, but it takes maybe 20 attempts or so to uh, get it working. Um, what was pretty useful um, was um, there is a software watchdog on the device. So the, the watchdog is effectively there to detect instability. Um, and if it detects a crash, it will cause the device to reboot. Um, which is really annoying for if you're trying to debug the thing um, because when you try and debug it, it just keeps rebooting when the crash happens. Um, but it's massively useful for exploitation because not the, when the service crashes and bombs out, the device just reboots and you get another try. So uh, what I found was um, basically I could run the exploit no more than 20 times and, and get a command shell reliably. Um, something else that was kind of annoying was um, because, as I mentioned, everything's loaded from this um, MS loader process. It all kicks in in child processes. Now, I don't know if anybody's tried debugging child processes with GDB, but GDB does not play nice with children. Uh, effectively, it doesn't really work too well at following um, child processes, uh, which was kind of annoying. So effectively, um, I had to uh, figure out a way to disable the watchdog, uh, which took me quite some time actually. Uh, I tried several tricks of um, you know, just killing the watchdog process, um, unloading the kernel module. Um, I tried like p-tracing to the thing and patching out several routines. Uh, eventually I realized I was just completely overcomplicating it and all I needed to do was just rename some shell script. Um, but yeah, effectively once I got uh, the kind of watchdog out of the way, I managed to get GDB server running on the device and um, realized GDB wouldn't work couldn't debug it. We ended up working with uh, effectively core files. So we would crash the device, take the core file off, uh, and analyze it on uh, another uh, QMU uh, VM. Um, so how do we get, uh, how do we actually exploit the thing? Well, um, what I found was uh, the PC register was overwritten uh, by whatever values you send it after roughly 176 bytes. There were, there were some other constraints in that um, there was a size limitation on the payload that you could send it. You couldn't go over 180 bytes. Um, something that was also kind of uh, quite annoying was uh, we found that a bunch of the registers were corrupted by our overflow, uh, including the stat pointer. And um, basically the shellcode that I wrote had to um, push some arguments to the stack when it was setting up the system call. So um, I had to basically fix the stat pointer, which was actually quite simple to do. Um, I found there was uh, the, the the payload we sent was corrupted in at least two locations. Um, so and these ended up getting executed. So we had to make sure that uh, when we sent our shell code, these two locations got converted to an instruction that wasn't going to modify or crash the process. The payload had to be URL safe. Um, so we couldn't send things like carriage return line feed. Uh, we couldn't send null bytes. Uh, we ended up getting around this um, just by URL encoding the payload. Um, so the way we exploited it was um, because the stack uh, was executable, we could um, effectively overwrite uh, the PC register with a hard-coded address of where our shellcode was living on the stack, which was kind of useful. Um, I got around the size constraints by writing the shellcode in uh, thumb mode because obviously thumb mode is, is uh, two bytes rather than uh, arm, which is four bytes. And then I wrote a little uh, loader um, as part of my shellcode to basically evade the other constraints. And all the loader did was um, effectively fix the value of the stat pointer. And then it, um, I basically sprayed, uh, initially sprayed the stack with um, some uh, NOP equivalent instructions which would uh, set R1 to be um, 
zero. And then I used that to uh, write zero or write null bytes into my shellcode where I needed them. Uh, then the rest of the loader basically just uh, jumped into thumb mode and skipped over um, the bits that got corrupted. So we, we can effectively exploit the stack overflow to get a command shell on the device. Now, unfortunately, this is, um, this is the same device that uh, the UART console died on um, or was disconnected. So I have videoed this exploit. Um, no worries, mate. Apparently, we've only got a few minutes, but. Um, so this is uh, the Python script that I wrote. Uh, effectively, uh, this is the UART console. I'm showing it's the same IP. And run the uh, Python scripts. You can see the payload it sends, our, our shell code. And uh, what it does is, uh, basically, the shell code just opens a uh, Netcat listener on port 8888. Eight. And you can see we've exploited the Stack Overflow and we have uh, root access against the device. Thank you. Now that was only a couple of slides, but actually it took me about two weeks to do that bloody thing. Um, so. Um, so I thought, you know, well, if there's one Stack Overflow, there's probably more. I uh, had a look at some of the uh, APIs that were um, configured on the device, and uh, it was widely using some of the more insecure APIs. There was like 311 sprint Fs, 59 strict copies, a couple of strict cats. Um, so it probably meant there are more memory corruption issues. And in fact, Matt started uh, like fuzzing the thing, and it was just like crashing left, right, and center. So if you are interested in uh, getting into IoT exploitation or ARM exploitation, uh, this device is probably a really good kind of, um, you know, Starting point. And Matt will just uh, sum up. So, uh, just to conclude, essentially, um, the way that consumer security systems and Internet of Things and embedded devices are, um, pretty much, you know, they're not as mature as your standard desktop estate. And we've been saying the same things for several years now. You know, processes, everything's running as root. Um, exploit mitigations that you're finding in smartphones and desktops are pretty much absent. Um, and they're plagued by numerous trivial bugs, command injections, overflows, heap overflows. Um, so they they really are a quite a nice target um, for for research purposes and just general hacking on. Um, so uh, that pretty much brings us to the conclusion. Um, so I think we've got a few minutes left now for a, a, a brief Q and A. If there are any questions. And also, uh, if you did find this kind of interesting and you'd want to play around with these kind of things, uh, we are hiring. So feel free to get in touch. <laughs> Questions? Scott. Um, I don't know, like, uh, I reckon, I, also, yeah, I mean, like, ultimately, uh, security costs money. Um, but when you start seeing, like, um, things in the press about, like, uh, IoT botnets and, and you know, half a million devices getting owned, then uh, I think people probably will start to take notice. And I think what we'll see is um, ultimately it will start to catch up. I mean, it's a soft target now, which is why we started looking at it, to be honest. But um, I think it will eventually catch up with kind of uh, desktop security. Any more? Another question? No, no, go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't tested Sammy's, uh, the, the Texas uh, C. Yeah, I mean, it's it's entirely possible. I mean, we just use the Hack RF just as an example, but you could probably use any number of platforms for doing that. Um, you could use something like RF Cat or, or an, another type tool. Um, essentially, the, the weaknesses are, are quite the same in many of these systems. Um, that one was just an example of how we did it, and we used the Hack RF. Um, but you could quite easily take other tool sets that are out there and apply it in the same way to other similar systems as well. And there are plenty of these things that are out there, um, and they're all just as trivial and susceptible to this kind of uh, attack. The, key, the keys themselves are quite large, so you would be trying to guess a lot, and when an alarm's going off, I mean, you'd probably be better to play a captured code, because the key space could be quite large to guess it in the time that the police were called. So. Okay, oh, one more. Uh, it, uh, 
I, I, I would go and get one that's used in a bank or has multiple channels out of it, something that's quite high security, depending on what you're protecting. I mean, you've got a view on what your assets are. Dominic was just protecting a couple of bags of PG tips, so it was, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I would look, 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 speak to the manufacturer, speak and, and, and get a system that suits your needs, preferably one that has multiple channels out, that can phone out, that maybe isn't using some uh, wireless proximity sensors and is in fact hardwired um, that, would, that would increase the difficulty. I mean, wireless in general, um, is going to introduce an element of risk that someone can, can do these kinds of attacks. And don't connect it to the internet. Yeah, and don't connect it to the internet. Yeah. So okay. So the manufacturers could release uh, updated hardware. Some of, the, some of the bugs that we did show were patched. Some of them are not. So some of them are still present in current firmware. Um, Unfortunately, they do need to update the firmware and push and push out updates, and in some cases, that's a manual thing. So a lot of these devices, people buy them, install them in their house, and leave them there. And, uh, and over time, it's almost like rot that they, they will be more and more vulnerable over um, a year or so. So it, it is kind of a prevalent problem in the way that firmware updates are being done on embedded devices in general. So uh, ultimately, I believe in full disclosure. I mean, it's a personal thing for some people, but my, my opinion is that um, full disclosure does work because it forces the vendor's hand to say, look, there is a problem and that they do need to address it. Um, we try to do a responsible disclosure practice. Nothing that we've shown here hasn't been sent to the uh, vendors in advance. So vendors are aware of these issues and, and, and how the, the problems impact their systems. Um, but ultimately, we believe that the power is in the consumer's hand. And if you show them something that's vulnerable, um, they can then go forward and say, hey, why isn't this fixed? And start demanding answers from the person who sold them a product. Right, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you.